tonight, Profile in Courage. I've been really angry and hurt and sad over what's happened. A grieving daughter speaks after her father is sentenced for killing her mother. What she wants Canadians to know. Why did the Liberals hide vital information? The many political ripples of the Mark Norman case. At issue is here to break it down. They broke the deal! And as the U.S. and China butt heads on trade, what Canadians need to look out for, this is the national. Some might say our lead story tonight is about Mohammed Shamji, about the sentence he received for killing his wife, Alana Frick, his crime when he'll be able to apply for parole. And we will report those details. But tonight's story is about another sentence, the one imposed on his children and their mother's family, about their pain, their love, and their healing. For years, Shamji tried to dominate and diminish them. Tonight, they get to tell their story. Ioana Ramiliotis begins with the events at court today. Imagine what it took to write it all down. Moments after the sentence, Anna Frick's grief spilled out in a statement. So did her horror. For two and a half years, we have waited for a moment to accept a, a responsibility for something he, we knew he did. He has done from the day one, knowing that the eldest daughter Yasmin will be an important witness because she ran into the bedroom when she heard a mother scream and later heard the thumping of the heavy suitcase going down the stairs. The girl, the eldest, only 11 at the time, was ordered by her father to go back to her room. When Anna and Joe Frick saw the children the next morning, they knew something was terribly wrong. It was clear to me from the strange way that the children was behaving Friday morning that they knew something was horribly happened, but they could not tell me because their father was hovering over them. The Fricks had driven all night from Windsor to get there when they couldn't reach their daughter Alana by phone. Her husband, Mohammed Shamji, told them she had run off with another man. Only a few weeks ago did he admit he killed her and dumped her body in a suitcase in a river. Court heard the former doctor saved lives for a living, only to kill his own wife. Yesterday and today talk about that, how many lives will save it in the past. Okay, I don't know about that, but I know how many lives he destroyed, okay? He destroyed many yes. lives. The investigation into Shamji revealed years of domestic abuse. The fatal outcome, took its toll on veteran officers too. You have to, on a daily basis, do a, a check within yourself, your, your emotional being, that you're, you're sound and, and you have to continue on with the investigation. Shamji's guilty plea, the judge noted, does spare the family the nightmare of a trial, but not the nightmare itself. Frick's warning to every victim of domestic violence comes from a broken heart. Unless they have the courage to leave their partners, at the early stage, they could suffer the same fate as Elena. Joanna, this marks the end of a, one terrible stage for the family, and, and you spoke to Elena Frick's mother and also her daughter. Yes, we did, and it was a tough interview, Ian. The family is devastated, and this little girl is still in a lot of pain. Here's a little bit of what she shared. I guess I just want to be able to move on. Like, not move on as in, like, not care about it. As it move on as in, like not feel like so uh, pained about it constantly. Yeah, does it hurt every day? When I think about it, yeah. I try not to think about it too much, but... Now, Joanna, we don't normally identify young victims of crime, so we should explain what's different about this story. Well, she had been at every court appearance, Ian, and she had insisted on that, and we thought that was extraordinary and wanted to get a sense of how she was coping. So we approached the family's lawyer, and she discussed it with Jasmine's counselors and, of course, her grandparents. And in the end, Jasmine wanted to talk to us, and her grandparents fully supported that because they hope it will help her move on. All right, Joanna, and we'll have uh, your full interview with them in about 10 minutes. In front of the courthouse today, the lead detective on Alana Frick's murder case pleaded with anyone who sees intimate partner violence to report it to authorities. It's often... We, we believe that somebody's going to do it, but nobody ends up doing it. And, and that's where it's a collective responsibility. We strongly encourage uh, anybody that needs assistance 
uh, that either they themselves or their family members step in. And that's where we can effectively combat this crime. Shelter workers see firsthand how difficult it is for victims to get help. People think, oh, you know, if someone hit me, I would leave right away. You don't. You don't leave for many, many reasons. The stats will point out that women often don't leave until after the 35th assault or they don't phone the police. And reporting the crime is just the beginning of a process. Some evidence suggests violence is punished less severely when an intimate partner is the victim. Between 2006 and 2010, about half the time, the sentence was probation. When jail time was handed down, about half the time, the sentence was one month or less. Frick reported Shamji's violence and threats in 2005, but charges were withdrawn. The relationship soon continued, and so did the abuse. Let's go to Ottawa now. And, Rosemary, you have new developments in the Mark Norman case. Yeah, that's right, Ian. As you know, yesterday the prosecution dropped those charges against the vice admiral. But today, opposition parties continued to hammer the government. The Prime Minister interfered in the judicial process. He withheld documents from the defence. Why did the Liberals hide vital information from the prosecution, the defence and from the rest of Canadians? Alongside those opposition attacks, though, there are other questions. Mark Norman had been working with Stephen Harper's government when the shipbuilding deal was signed, yet key Conservatives weren't formally interviewed by the RCMP. But some former cabinet ministers say they did give information helpful to Norman's defence, and today they spoke with our Murray Brewster. They were all key players in former Prime Minister Stephen Harper's cabinet and they all went to bat for Vice Admiral Mark Norman when the RCMP accused him of leaking cabinet secrets. I also met uh, for uh, about two hours with Admiral Norman's uh, legal defense team uh, last year in Toronto and I gave them information which I believe would have helped uh, with his uh, uh, exoneration had this case gone uh, to trial. Former Defence Minister Peter McKay also met with Norman's attorneys and he says he absolutely thinks what he said was key to getting the Vice Admiral off the hook. As we reported last night, the prosecution began to collapse in March, partly under the weight of new information from several former Conservative ministers and staffers, people the RCMP and the Crown never formally interviewed. But not everyone thinks that explains the Crown's decision. I think it's been a simplification of it to say that because the defence questioned a few Conservatives that that led to this going away. The DPP hadn't questioned me and clearly they felt they had a case against uh, uh, Admiral Norman before. So I really think it was the slow and deliberate delays from the Trudeau government on uh, releasing information that Mark Norman needed to defend himself. No one has seen the evidence that caused the Crown to change its mind and the defence wouldn't say. So today, those renewed opposition claims of political interference. I quite frankly find it offensive when, when a member in this House rises and, and impugns the integrity and reputation of the RCMP and the Director of Public Prosecutions by suggesting that they would ever conduct their business okay. in any way which was less than independent. Vice Admiral Mark Norman has said he wants to go back to work. The military, however, today said it can't say when or what he will do. Murray Brewster, CBC News. Ottawa. So what is clear tonight is that the legal case, this part anyway, may be over, but the fallout is far from it. Former Conservative cabinet ministers now talking, the Liberals you heard there under attack, rightly or wrongly. So what are the political consequences for either side here? It's all perfect fodder for the at-issue gang. Andrew, Chantal and Shachi Curl will have all of that a little bit later. Right now in Washington, trade talks are underway between China and the United States, and Donald Trump has added a degree of tension. If there is no deal by midnight Eastern, Trump says he'll dramatically ramp up tariffs on Chinese goods. If that means a trade war, you will be caught in the crossfire. The two countries had seemed to be making progress on lowering tariffs and settling disputes over intellectual property. But last weekend, China suddenly called for big changes to the working document. That's when Trump threatened to raise existing tariffs from 10% to 25 and impose new ones on another $325 billion worth of products. Trump says the U.S. can't lose, but Keith Bogue tells us who really pays for those tariffs. They broke the deal! Donald Trump says he thought he had a deal with China, but they broke it, leading to this week's showdown. That part might be true. This part is definitely not true. They'll be paying 
We don't make the deal. Nothing wrong with taking in over $100 billion a year. The $100 billion a year doesn't relate to anything and appears to be made up. Total U.S. customs revenue from China and the entire rest of the world last fiscal year were only about $41 billion. This year, they're expected to rise to $74 billion, largely due to the trade war. But the Chinese don't pay those duties anyway. U.S. consumers and businesses pay them. And none of that takes into account the damage done to U.S. businesses when China strikes back with tariffs on things like soybeans. The government set aside $12 billion to offset those costs, and again, it's U.S. taxpayers who are picking up that tab. A study by the Center for Economic Policy Research published in March concluded that the duties were almost completely passed through into U.S. domestic prices. And on top of that, those duties made the economy less efficient, costing $1.4 billion a month. This is not just a U.S. problem, as the IMF emphasized today. Everybody loses in a protracted trade uh, uh, conflict. Um, if trade is, is damaged, then it, uh, it threatens growth. In other words, Ian, nobody wins a trade war. But Donald Trump doesn't believe that. He said that the U.S. will win big in this trade war and that winning will be easy. So, Keith, tell us what's behind the president's perspective on trade. Well, it seems that before the tariffs were imposed last year, Trump's economic team told him that even though U.S. consumers would nominally pay the tariffs, China's exporters would effectively pay them, largely by lowering their prices. That was the theory that allowed Trump to claim that China was paying for the cost of the trade war. But the theory apparently doesn't hold water. A year later, the data seems to show the Trump administration was just wrong. But now it's doubling down on its trade strategy. More than doubling down, actually. All right, Keith, thank you. Thanks, Ian. When titans clash, bystanders can get hurt. Canada is mired in its own troubled relations with China. But as Katie Simpson tells us, if Beijing and Washington drop the gloves and really go at it, the damage to this country could reach well beyond canola fields. There's a potato skin. Mary Robinson's family has been farming on Prince Edward Island for more than 200 years. While some uncertainty is always to be expected, Canada's dispute with China is making life so much more difficult for farmers all across the country. Any small business or larger business in Canada, and if you tell them they're really not going to know if they're going to make any money this year, and if they know there's great uncertainty in their business, yes, that, that has a direct impact on the, the mood. The Prime Minister voiced those concerns directly to President Donald Trump today as the Americans host China for trade talks. A senior government source says during a phone call this afternoon, Justin Trudeau reminded Trump that Ottawa is being punished by Beijing for arresting a Chinese tech executive at the request of the U.S. Trudeau's main focus was on two Canadians arrested in China, highlighting the deplorable conditions of their detention. We've made it very clear to the United States administration, if they do reach some kind of deal with uh, China, that we expect, first of all, our two hostages to be freed, and then the Chinese to pull back on their, the pressure they're putting to us, particularly on our agri-food. This former Canadian diplomat says investors will be the next casualty of any heightened trade war. We continue to live in an unsettled world, and the stock market, as we saw today, will take a hit. Canadian manufacturers were bracing for bad news as well. If you are a Canadian company who has a supply chain interest in perhaps uh, a product going in either direction, you know, what would be the implications for you of a retaliatory tariff? Might your product uh, potentially be, be priced out of the market? Sources say Trump was receptive to Trudeau's pitch to keep Canadian concerns in mind. Phone calls between these two leaders typically are pleasant, but it certainly does not mean the president is going to do anything on Canada's behalf. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. The Canadian Pediatric Society wants young women and men to have better access to contraceptives. It's calling on all levels of government to remove a key barrier, the cost. The group wants all forms of birth control to be publicly funded until age 25. That includes condoms, which also protect against sexually transmitted diseases, and IUDs, which can cost hundreds of dollars. It also wants access to be confidential. As Christine Birak tells us, the society says the benefits will far outweigh the costs. Do you use this one a lot? Yeah. 
Not everyone feels comfortable handling a uterus or even talking about birth control. Just being able to hold them and they're squishy, yeah. like it took away a lot of the fear. Here at Planned Parenthood, they answer questions and see firsthand how tough it is for some people to pay for contraceptives, including the pill. Uh, young people coming in with their loonies and quarters and sort of putting them out on the desk, buying one pack at a time. I've heard of folks trying to stretch a pack, you know, taking their pill every other day, not taking them as instructed. Instead of pills that have to be taken daily, last year the Canadian Pediatric Society recommended longer-acting reversible contraceptives such as IUDs, which can run about $400 up front. Many teens will tell you using their parents' private insurance isn't an option. Still in high school, sometimes they don't want to necessarily talk to their parents about going on birth control. Which is why the society's recommendation to offer free birth control to young people could be a game changer. The most recent numbers show in a single year nearly 60,000 Canadian women under the age of 25 had unplanned pregnancies. Doctors say the costs related to those unintended pregnancies far outweigh the price of birth control. We also know that it, in a lot of ways it, it changes their plans and that they would have had for their life in terms of education uh, and future employment. Unplanned pregnancies lead to higher social assistance and medical costs and some women will choose to have an abortion. We know that a termination by itself can cost anywhere from $500 to $700, $1,200, $1,500. So just in that, we could, if we offered free IUDs to young people, then we wouldn't be paying for their terminations. Young people and their parents might not see eye to eye on having sex, but both sides would agree. Virtually no one wants an unplanned pregnancy. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight, including a staggering new report on how many profits from crime are being poured into the BC real estate market. Wealthy criminals and those attempting to evade taxes have had the run of our province for too long. The report found more than $5 billion worth of real estate transactions in 2018 came from dirty money, the proceeds of crime. That accounts for 72% of all money laundered in the province last year, and it's believed to have increased real estate prices province-wide by an average of 5%, even higher in Vancouver. BC says it will take action. Ontario Senator Lynn Bayak has been officially suspended without pay. In what she calls a free speech issue, she refused to remove and apologize for racist letters posted on her website. Parliamentarians have not had their freedom of expression threatened like this since the events that led to the enactment of the Bill of Rights. Some of the letters described Indigenous people as lazy and entitled and that they should be very grateful for residential schools. But the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission report found that more than 3,000 children died in their care and more than 30,000 students, that's one in five, were victims of sexual assault. Ahead tonight, Uber is looking for investors, like other than the rest of us just getting free rides. Uh, we'll look at what could be a bumpy road ahead. But first, confusion, anger, heartbreak, and finally some relief tonight for a 14-year-old girl now that her father has been sentenced to life in prison for murdering her mother. I mean, it's weird to know that somebody you can be related, that you're related to, can be so inhumane, I guess. So evil. Or now in our top story in a voice you don't often hear. After the court handed Mohammed Shamji his sentence for the murder of his wife, Alana Frick, there was agreement on what was most important. She left the three small children behind. How to keep the best interests of the children in mind. The focus should be squarely on the welfare of the children going forward. Frick's three children will need support and strength to try to overcome the trauma of their loss and heal. Speaking with Alana Frick's mother and her eldest daughter, Ioana Emiliotis found relief, a readiness to move forward, and a sense of how hard that will be. In this tragic story, she is the most haunting figure. A young girl who heard her mother die, who had to face the killer, her own father, in court. Do you want to keep your jacket on? Jasmine and her grandmother, Anna Frick, say, talking about the horror is helping them heal. 
These last couple of days must have been really uh, emotional. Tell me how you're feeling now that it's over. I, have I feel a relief that we don't have to go through this no more, that this is over, that we can close our book and look forward for our life with the children. How about you? Uh, same thing. I'm just relieved that I don't have to do this anymore. Jasmine had to testify at a preliminary inquiry about the night she woke to her mother screaming to find her father wide-eyed and panicked. But it wasn't until he pled guilty that she could exhale, knowing that meant no trial. So how do you feel that you don't have to go through that? Relieved and happy. Yeah. Were you anxious about it? Yeah, I, I felt like I would have had an emotional breakdown if I had to go on the witnesses stand. The decision to do this interview came after discussions with her counselor and her grandparents, who are now her guardians, as well as the family's lawyer. I've had the chance to talk about my mom, but I haven't had the chance to talk about it and have it, like, you know, public. I can't, I don't know the word. Publicized? Public? Public? Yeah, like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and why was that important? I guess just so that people would know who she was, how she was really cheerful, even though she was dealing with so much. Off limits were any questions about that awful night. But the horror of how Alana Frick died, how Shamji struck her several times and strangled her, played out in court. Those details, listening to them again, must have been very difficult. You know, it was difficult for me because I didn't know before what he did to her, all the stuff, and I just, I just broke down. How much pain she's endured before she, she, she was gone. You know, I didn't exactly like hearing what they were saying. So I guess I kind of just blocked it out of my mind and tried not to think about it. Did you want to be in the courtroom? I had some questions that I needed to be ans that needed to be answered, so I decided to stay. What questions did you have? Uh, just how it had happened. I was confused, I guess. So I just needed, I, I really needed to know. Court heard Ilana Frick endured years of abuse. Jasmine witnessed some of it. So did her grandmother. I know she hid a lot of stuff from me, and she loved him. And she hoped maybe someday that he might change, he will be better, but he never changed. Break my heart, I felt helpless. You were aware of what she was going through, right? That must have been really hard. Yeah, it, it was. Did you ever try to talk to her about it, or? Uh, she initiated conversations about it sometimes. She had asked me, like, a few times if I'd want to live a life without, you know, him. Frick's decision to leave was likely the trigger. Shamji killed her days after she told him she planned to. Your dad, your, your former son-in-law, apologized to you in court. What do you think of that apology? Uh, I don't think much. His apology was only for himself, because from the day one he knew what he did, and also I knew that he do, did, did it, so did the children. What did you think, Jasmine, of the apology? Um, sorry, I'm just thinking about how I felt. It's okay, take your yeah, time. Yeah, take time. Uh, I guess I felt, it felt weird to like look him in the eye and hear him actually address me because he hasn't like I haven't spoken to him face to face in like two and a half years so it was kind of scary I didn't really like it so I was happy when he got it over with if you had a chance to talk to him do you have any questions for him I would be uncomfortable I wouldn't really know what to say and I just don't want to see him again the judge has ordered Shamji have no contact with his children while in custody. Before he was let off in handcuffs, Anna Frick demanded he look at them. I did it just to see him, what he's gonna miss in for all those years that he's gonna be locked. Let them see, and I hope he felt the pain in his heart and soul, what he did and what he's gonna miss these children. It's unimaginable what the children are going through.
I mean, it's weird to know that somebody you can be related, th that you're related to, can be so inhumane, I guess. So evil. It's been, well, yeah, it's been emotional. Uh, I've been really angry and hurt and sad over what's happened. And I guess that's really it. I mean, there are times that I felt really happy, but there are also times that I just felt really awful about everything. Mother's Day, what's that like for you? Is it coming up? Uh, it's kind of just like a punch to me. It, like it, it hurts kind of just to, you know, look around and you see all these, uh, you know, like Mother's Day posters, like get your mom this to make her happy. And then, you know, thinking about how things have been in the past few years just kind of hurts. When you picture your future, when you're older, um, what do you want to see? Well, I guess I want to see me being happy. Like, well, I am happy, kind of, but I want to be happier in the future, I guess. You will be happy. <laughs> it will take time see, to heal, you know, these wounds, because it wasn't easy those two and a half years. But eventually, we'll go on with our life and we will be happy. And maybe get the chance to be a regular kid again. I'm so proud of her. <laughs> she was so God, good. You're so you know? sappy. She's so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm proud of you, honey. You are. Thank you. <laughs> At her recent confirmation, Jasmine Frick chose her mother's name, Alana. As she said, it was to express how she wanted to go forward in life. What an incredible young woman. Um, up next on The National, new details tonight in the Mark Norman case. We will look at what's at stake for both the Liberals and the Conservatives. Andrew Chantal and Shachi Curl are here at issue, coming up right after this break. I am confident that uh, at all times, I acted with integrity, I acted ethically. We still have lots of questions about why the government was so afraid of the truth coming to light. Why did the Liberals hide vital information from the prosecution, the defense, and from the rest of Canadians? The process involved in, uh, in a public prosecution like this is entirely independent uh, of my office. The case against Vice Admiral Mark Norman may be over, but the political fallout is still very much going on. So which party stands to benefit, if, if any, and, and where do we go from here at issue? Here to dig into that and a little bit more, Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne in Toronto, and Shachi Curl joins us from Vancouver tonight. Good to see everyone. Uh, so this is one of these cases that had been bubbling away, uh, a little bit hard to understand, I think, because it was deep into sort of procurement talk and then just suddenly ended this week. Um, does anyone come out, other than uh, Vice Admiral Norman, does anyone come out ahead politically in this? Uh, Chantal, I'll start with you. Uh, I don't think anybody comes out really ahead politically. I suspect that the Liberals uh, are probably relieved uh, that this is going to be behind them before the election campaign because they could have had to campaign throughout the uh, next fall against the backdrop of testimony uh, that they had no control over, involving some of their own people, former ministers, clerks, go down the list. So it would have been a nightmare for them. That, that the fact that the charges are dropped does not validate their position. But I don't think there's enough traction to this to keep it going for until as long as the SNC-Lavalin, for instance. Yeah, well, Andrew, that's a, that's a good question. Be because it is sort of complex, and you raised all the unanswered questions today in your column, but it, does that allow the Liberals a little bit more breathing space away from this? And because there's nothing that you can sort of point to and say, oh, you did that wrong. No, I mean, it's not as uh, complicated, perhaps, as uh, snc Laughlin. It's still pretty simple, though, that I, they basically, this guy, the, the Vice Admiral Norman, was basically put under a cloud for two years, dragged through the muck uh, in what looks like a very thin case that ultimately collapsed. So, yeah, they don't have to go through the trial, it looks like, but there's still a lot of these questions that have to be answered about why was the defense able to get this information that essentially made the case collapse and neither the police nor the prosecution had it? Why was the government so um, weirdly reluctant to 
released basic documents that the prosecution, that the defense was, was seeking. Why were there these strange meetings where nobody took any notes when they were discussing matters like should we fire the, the, the second in command of the, of the military? And indeed, why did this thing go to, uh, to go to trial in the first place? Or why was it about to go to trial? Yeah. Um, you know, there's no doubt about it. The, the starting point for this was the government referring uh, charges to the RCMP. The RCMP had a choice whether or not to investigate. But I think... Well, P P PCO referring charges. PCO. Just well, to be 100% accurate. Again, part of the government. And indeed, as we've seen uh, in, in recent times, there's real questions about just how independent and nonpartisan the PCO is or was under Michael Wernick. Yeah. So there's questions that come out of that. And as I say, if you're the a senior officer of the RCMP and this is handed to you, you may well think this might be a career-limiting move if I don't proceed with this. So I think there's still a lot of questions. And one avenue that we may see yeah. it explored in is if Vice Admiral uh, Norman decides to bring a lawsuit against yeah. the government. And yeah. that'll be one of the questions to be seen. Although, I mean, when you're reading how the case unfolded, uh, I certainly had questions as to what the RCMP was actually doing. It, it, you know, if they didn't speak to Vice Admiral Norman, they didn't speak to anyone in the Conservatives. Exactly. It, it's a curious uh, investigation in terms of how complete it was. Shat you weigh in on, on what you think the fallout from this actually is. So you had asked about if there are any winners. I don't think there are, but I think there's one big loser, and again, that is the Trudeau government. This just adds to sort of the drip, drip, drip that carries over from the SNC scandal and the unanswered questions about that. So, you know, Chantal and Andrew, you've talked about they've tried to cauterize the wound a little bit, end it early, yes. But at this point, the details don't matter. What Scott Bryson did or didn't do or what PCO did or didn't do that may or may not have been inappropriate does not have a lot of bearing on people trying to follow this story. Their 10-second takeaway is that they no longer are predisposed to give this government the benefit of the doubt based on what they saw in the first quarter of this year. Remember when we all used to marvel about Justin Trudeau's approval numbers being at 65 percent? Well, now his disapproval is at 67 percent. So there isn't a lot of willingness, I think, within the public to say, oh, well, maybe, maybe they didn't do anything with this one, or maybe everything was on the up and up. And the other factor is uh, Vice Admiral Norman has not had his say yet. He has not yes, told yeah. the entirety of his story. It's only going to add to a really tight timeline that Trudeau has and his government has to try and sort of staunch or stop the wound and try to start healing. And it, it looks at this point today like he might be running out of time. Chantal, what, okay. what do you think? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I don't disagree with any of that, but it was a lose-lose. Uh, it's lose this week or lose over the course of the campaign. Uh, I and yes, I, I agree that uh, everyone is going to be curious to hear uh, what comes next in this story. But there are also, uh, and to go back to your point, Rosie, <laughs> questions to be asked of the RCMP. Mm -hmm. uh, you would think that on the heels of what happened with the Mike Duffy trial, there yes. would be a test that the RCMP and the prosecutors would put to themselves when politics collides with what may be criminal or what may be uh, inappropriate behavior. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't seem like that test was applied or that due diligence was done. It is surprising, amazing, that the RCMP never talked to uh, people from the Harper era when they, some of their charges, went back to that era. So, yes. yes, lots of questions, not only of the Trudeau government. L last word to you on this, and then I'll uh, switch topics. Well, just to amplify something Sachi said, you know, it, it, we're in, almost in a campaign mode now. And oftentimes when these things explode during a campaign, it's not the direct damage that's done that really hurts the party. It's the robbing, they're robbed of time to get their own message, to get their own themes out. Point. And the yep. Liberals are now in a position where they're starting from seven, eight points behind. They need to start getting their own message out, and this is just going to continue to frustrate their ability to do that. Okay, I, I want to switch to uh, this week's Green Party victory in Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Uh, it's something everyone I know all of you have thought about and written about. Some some analysis, not yours, but other people, maybe overblown because <laughs> it is a by-election, but let's let's weigh in on, on whether this actually matters. But first, here's the uh, leader of the Green Party obviously celebrating. The target is to be effective uh, to achieve what must be achieved for the future of our children and grandchildren. The only way to do that is, frankly, if it's a minority parliament where there are enough Greens elected to hold whoever we can work with to account. So good news for the Green Party, Shachi, but there was lots of other news that the other parties have to digest in some way as well out of what happened. 
What we saw in this by-election and what we're seeing in terms of the public mood is also a bleed of the, the progressive left or the left of center to parties away from the Liberals and the NDP, which have been the traditional homes for people who are left of center. The Greens continue to be the only party that have clean hands on the climate change file, in part because they've never governed. But still, uh, if you are a past Liberal voter who voted because of the climate change promise, and now you're ticked off because of pipelines and tankers, you now have a natural home with Elizabeth May and the and the Greens. Plus, there is the added credibility of MLAs in British Columbia, in Ontario, in New Brunswick, in Prince Edward Island. So where four years ago, uh, the opposition leaders might have said, or Jagmeet Singh, the prime minister, might have said, uh, a vote for the Greens is a vote for the Conservatives. Yes. In fact, there is some credibility now behind her argument that a vote for the Greens could actually just be a vote for the Greens. Chantal. Well, uh, listening to that clip, you, what you hear is uh, the Green Party offering to take up the position that the NDP used to claim uh, as in the conscience of Parliament, not the power. Uh, and that uh, speaks to the trouble that the NDP is in, yeah. that when the issue is climate, it is really hard for them to position themselves in that way. Uh, and the results uh, were certainly terrible news for the NDP. It was an NDP seat. Yeah. It's going to make it harder for Mr. Singh to keep his party united. You've already got Sven Robinson, who is going to be running in the next campaign, saying that uh, Jagmeet Singh has to take firm, firm positions against some of the energy projects that the NDP and BC uh, has signed up for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also agree that uh, for the Liberals, it is a clear signal that, that they are bleeding to the Green Party, that they're, and that the votes from the NDP that they counted on, because the NDP is weak, maybe going somewhere else. So that's bad news. To uh, Sashi's list uh, of yeah. Greens, I would add Quebec Solidaire, uh, yes. whose campaign was right. really a Green campaign, and it really paid off. And, and the NDP have now lost two uh, of their former seats, Outremont and this one, two in, in just over two months. Andrew. We all like to caution ourselves not to read too much into by-election results, but when a Green Party is winning a seat, when the governing party is finishing fourth in good economic times, um, something's afoot. Part of that is, as mentioned, that people are more willing to look further afield now to vote for parties they didn't vote for before. But part of it is, as uh, Chantal was mentioning, the, the fragmentation on the left. There's two ways in which the Liberals can traditionally corral that vote on the left within the Liberal camp. One is to have a really inspiring uh, leader and campaign on the Liberal side, and they, we saw a bit of that in 2015, where they were able to get people to come over to them. The other is to really frighten people with the Tories and to say you have to vote for us to, to stay out of the uh, to, to keep the Tories out. Well, people aren't going to be terribly inspired uh, on the left to vote for Justin Trudeau this time around. There's, there's been too much disillusionment since then. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the Tories. You can certainly see that the Liberals are ginning up to try and, and run a fear campaign about the Tories, about what they represent. Uh, Andrew Shear's got, I think, a real both a challenge and an opportunity, therefore, to try and prevent the Liberals from making such a demonizing them to such an extent that they can unify that vote on the left. And so it'll be interesting to see with these five speeches he's giving, whether that will be part of what he tries to do is to make himself less scary to centrist voters. And we're going to talk more about that in the podcast. So thanks for that free tease, Andrew Coyne. Mm -hmm. and, and one more thing I want to mention before we go. Uh, last weekend at the press gallery dinner, our very own a gal right here, oh. Chantel, won the, <laughs> she's going to hate me after this. She won the Charles Lynch Award for Outstanding Public Affairs Coverage, one of the most uh, prominent awards you can get in journalism. So our congratulations to you, Chantel. You well know, deserved. Well you. done. That's Yay, right. We're happy to have you here. Yay, Chantel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, before we go, be sure to subscribe to add issue the podcast for extra content. Andrew hinted at what it is this week. Uh, we are talking about Andrew Shear's foreign policy pitch, one of a handful of speeches he's giving over the next number of weeks. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. And next on The National, Uber is going public tomorrow. The hype has been huge, but what sort of ride are investors in for? You're paying your executives millions of dollars and you're taking away everything from your drivers. We are live here in the National, and we have an update on the important trade talks in Washington. We're just coming in. The U.S. and China will resume discussions in the morning. 
There had been a deadline of midnight Eastern for the two countries to reach a deal before Washington was threatening to impose tariff hikes. That would amount to hundreds of billions of dollars on goods imported from China. But the U.S. officials have now agreed to continue the talks with the Chinese vice premier. We are going to move you to a new home. Some cautious optimism for a First Nation in northern Ontario. The Kasheshawan community has reached an agreement with the provincial and federal governments to relocate to higher ground. Every year, the community has to be evacuated because of spring flooding. The move will likely take about eight years. Ride-sharing company Uber is about to venture down a new road, Wall Street. Its shares begin trading tomorrow on the New York Stock Exchange in the biggest initial public offering since Facebook seven years ago. If you want in, it's being priced at 45 bucks US a share. As the CBC's Jacqueline Hansen tells us, investors who sign up for the journey could be in for a bumpy ride. It could be the ride of a lifetime for investors. Uber has called itself the Amazon of transportation, disruptive and eventually, hopefully, worthwhile for investors. Amazon is trying to be everything to you for your retail needs, and they want to be everything for your transportation and, and other things down the road that they haven't even thought of. Uber is losing piles of money. Sure, it completed 5 billion rides last year, but it lost $2.4 billion. Its biggest cost? Drivers. But many drivers say they're not being paid enough. You're paying your executives millions of dollars and you're taking away everything from your drivers. Plus, it has serious competition in everything it does. And legal and regulatory issues, along with investing in ambitious projects, all add up. Uber isn't even sure it's possible to get from point A, losing money, to point B, profit. One route could be driverless cars. Is if you take a $10 ride, the driver is getting $8 of that. So if Uber can take the driver out of the equation, that basically all falls to the bottom line. They have to pay a little bit more for the self-driving cars, but it's nothing compared to how much more money they would make. That could be a decade or more away, though. And analysts say if Uber keeps burning through cash, the new money it raises won't last that long. It's not unusual for tech companies to go public without making a profit first, but it will be a long road ahead before investors will know if Uber will pay off. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. The moment is up next, and tonight it's a homecoming in Vancouver in a saga that we have been watching here very closely on The National. Okay. So we figured, let's come down and see it. And we're like, oh, the poor little koi and little otter needed to eat. So, <laughs> like, how did he get in? That's the one question. So you might remember this saga that took place in November of last year. The otter against the prize fish devastating for 11 koi at the Sun Yat-sen Chinese Garden in downtown Vancouver. The story made international news because of that guy there. Three adult koi were rescued and they were taken to the Van Vancouver Aquarium for safekeeping. And today, months after the attack, the fish returned to the scene of the crime. Their homecoming is our moment. In late November 2018, a, a river order entered the site, killing 11 adult koi. The story has become something of an urban legend, with the river order often replaced in retelling by a sea otter, seal, raccoon, and even a groundhog. It feels good to get them back to uh, the proper home. Time really flies. So yeah, it feels good to get them back. For the past 33 years, our koi have helped us bring people from all backgrounds together in understanding and appreciation. They're intelligent as they are beautiful, symbolizing fortune, abundance and perseverance, which they have certainly shown through this process. So they may be intelligent, but the otter was pretty smart too. And I have always been f fairly firmly team otter. They have, they have closed now the entrance and exits though to prevent further otters from coming in and eating everybody. 
Well, or to try to prevent them. Listen, yeah. you know, you mentioned that, like, human nature, Rosie, being what it is, we were quick to get divided in this city between <laughs> Team Otter and Team Koi. Buttons were handed out. Some see this as the beautiful, defenseless Koi. Others see this as a story of a resourceful and clearly hungry Otter. <laughs> and so we go to sleep tonight, a city divided. And maybe I'll <laughs> stop by the gardens on the way to work tomorrow and see how this first night turned out. Good plan. That is the National for May 9th. Good night. Good night. <laughs>